Thank you, David. And I'm delighted to be part of this project. It's been great fun. Um, I want to start on a couple of just quick personal notes. One is that um, I encountered the main subject of my talk today, this fellow, Matthew Lukish, long ago when I was writing my dissertation. And I, at the time, thought, oh, I want to do more about this guy. So decades passed. And when I saw the call from for this conference, Lukish immediately popped into my mind. So I'm delighted to uh, come back to them in more, to him in more detail. The second personal note is speaking of blindness, uh, you know, those of us of a certain generation, Roger, perhaps a couple of others, uh, when we were growing up may have been told to not do certain things or you'll go blind. Uh, maybe some of you think of Portnoy's complaint. I don't have in mind masturbation, but I do have in mind my mother telling me to be sure to, when I read or do my homework, to be sure to use plenty of light. So um, I'll come back to that. Um, so Matthew Lukish, this is a little passage from a book that came out about him in the early 90s, a very, you know, hagiography. But uh, he was genuinely a real character. Uh, I mean, I think Americans aren't as good at producing characters as the Brits, but this guy was all those things listed in this opening sentence of his autobiography. Um, David, you're fading in and out. Really? Okay. Sound is fading in and out. Okay. I'm not sure what to do. Sometimes that happens with my internet connection, but usually it's, it's okay. Um, let me know if it becomes a serious problem. So um, I'm most, we're interested in him because of his role. Um, he ended up becoming known as the father of the science of seeing. And he did his work mostly at, from his perch at General Electric uh, over 40 years where he was head of um, the, the Lighting Research Laboratory at Nila Park, which was at GE's headquarters in, uh, in Cleveland. But he also was an incredible uh, kind of ambassador and crusader for his cause, which was to study and, uh, you know, the effects of artificial lighting, the interaction of artificial lighting with human sight and to improve it. So, you know, this isn't a great man study here. Um, what I'm in, why I'm interested in him um, is, is analytically for reasons I'll get to in a second. But let me just tell you, you know, point out one of the opening lines in this Neela produced biography was very kind of defensive in a way, right? Although he worked for a commercial enterprise, there's no doubt his conclusions were not affected in any way by the profit-making side of his business. Uh, he was a humanist who tried to serve mankind. So I'm interrogating that claim and I'm arguing that in fact, the boundaries between him as a scientist and the business uh, realm and commercialization were quite porous. So what I wanna suggest is to see how the work that Lukish did uh, more prominently than anyone else diffused through our society and went through this series of stages where his research was the, the study of eyesight in relation to human, uh, in, in relation to artificial lighting was first scientized, then organized, then popularized, commercialized, and finally codified into law. <clears throat> and, and some of these, uh, these are, some of these are overlapping phases in my story. So there's Neela, um, and again, he was this the GE headquarters, the research branch. He, command, he commanded significant resources over a major period of time. And I believe that, um, you know, more, this is a case where the scientific and medical research was developed on the, the science of eyesight was, came out of the private sector more than it came out of 
the medical community. So uh, that, you know, as for organizing what Lukish did, um, like uh, so many emerging professions, they, you see, you'll see all the standard kind of paraphernalia of the professionalization project. They form a society. He was the founding member. They come out with a professional journal. They hold conferences and proceedings and all that stuff. And um, they talked, you know, centrally about health and safety. But in fact, you see in the language, the founding language, this other language seeping in. Like, well, part of the equipment of the successful salesman of Illuminance should be the knowledge that we're generating. So related to that were all these major organizations that had been around for a while and that were continuing to appear in the electric utility industry. And their, the way they operate and the way they related to each other was a bit different from our typical um, you know, trade association in the sense that after electric utilities, electric companies competed fiercely for a while, they settled down into these territorial <laughs> monopolies. And there was very little movement. It's kind of like Europe, you know, forming nation states. And after a while, there's skirmishes. Uh, there was never a world war that broke out. So they're sharing information that ordinarily would, you know, other firms and more competitive industries would consider proprietary and they're supporting these efforts. In the Edison Electric Institute 1933 launched a massive national campaign, millions of dollars behind it, better sight, better light, better sight. That was Lukesh's brainchild. So as a next stage, so we're organizing at nat through national you know, trade associations. As a next stage, the private utility industry picks up. And the first utility to have an, uh, an illuminating engineering department in America, just coming two years after the foundation, the formation of the Illuminating Engineering Society was Boston Edison. Revealingly, they set this up in the sales department, not in a technical department. And they make claims when they're in their heavy advertising to their customers that this will give you more light for the same money or the same light for less money. But that's not what happens, and that's not really what they wanted. Because now that they were a territorial monopoly, the challenge they had was to, they couldn't get more customers, you know, electricity starting to become universal. So they had to increase the per capita usage of their, among their existing customers. By the mid 20s, they have 17 professionals who are working in seven different sections, all in illuminating engineering. And in the 20s, the marketing department of Boston Edison was the largest department in the company, a monopoly. Why are they marketing, right? I mean, larger than the departments that are running the giant generating plants and the transmission distribution network, their need to intensify per capita usage. The marketing was quite sophisticated segmented for the commercial customers. They would go out, do a site survey, produce a very nicely designed notebook and say that if you're a store, you become one of the first with electric lighting, you'll draw more business. And that was absolutely true, except that once all the stores had electric lights in the town or the street, then that advantage went away. If you're an industrial customer, they said, uh, this will make the work more efficient and safer, but also there's an element of surveilling and controlling the workforce so you don't have workers kind of goofing off in the dark shadows. For residential customers, uh, they didn't get this kind of full treatment with a write-up, but they went to every single commercial and industrial customer in their territory and gave them proposals. The residents, most of them still were just getting their homes wired for electricity. So here they took a more modest approach. They would start with a single room. They started with the kitchen and then they would come in with meters and tables 
and go from room to room and say, oh, over here in your kitchen, you need a number 17 fixture or whatever. I actually, again, decades ago, interviewed a guy, an, an elderly gentleman who had actually done this work in the 1920s. And here it's a couple of things he told me. Uh, he said, after the kitchen, we went into the living room, decided the type of fixture to use there. And then we came up with one that would throw the lighting back up on the ceiling and back again. And he said, they had these meters, right? And he put the meter down and show them that they were getting what they were getting. Now, it would probably be a minimum number of foot candles. In other words, he would say, oh, well, actually, you know, your kid's eyesight is going to be damaged because you, you don't have enough light here. You need a number 12 fixture and we can take care of that. Uh, two, two minutes, David. Okay. So anyway, this gains momentum. I have a, an exhibit with massive funding from all of these different organizations. And um, meanwhile, Lukish is evolving on the issue of light and blindness from in the beginning, he's saying, well, you could have eye strain if you don't have enough. By the twenties, he writes a whole chapter in a book saying, well, we usually find this out too late, you know, scary stuff like Roland Marchand talks about, right? And how, these modern products provided solutions to what could be dire, you know, dire consequences when not using the right product. By 34, he's writing a whole book about this revealing the deeply hidden effects, which are wasting human resources. Here's the crux. On the one hand, Lukish and all these armies of illuminating engineers are saying, don't scrimp on light and the result of that would be that you would pay more money and in fact when they went through this process the electric bills typically double in the households at the same time say oh glare is terrible for the eyes so you don't want to look directly at light you have to shade it you have to have indirect light what's the consequence of that more kilowatt hours used. So either way you go, <laughs> you're using more electricity, either by boosting up the lumens or by boosting up the lumens and shading them. So eventually this gets codified into law and then for the Boston, Massachusetts example, they pass a code 1924 right in the thick of this, uh, covering these kinds of things, reducing glare, and this, in one of the most remarkable passages I found, a Boston Edison illuminating engineer says, anticipating the adoption of the code, this division, the Boston Edison illuminating engineering division, aided in the training of the inspectors to be responsible for its enforcement. And you can bet they also basically wrote the codes too. So, uh, as a final thing I'm doing for this project, uh, I'm actually going into, you know, these vast archives of contemporary state-of-the-art medical and scientific literature on the issue of uh, lighting intensity and blindness or damage to the eyes. And I can tell you so far, <laughs> uh, the claim, I, they're not, saying that anymore, right? Like they maybe will say eye strain, but I'm not even sure what that means. So the central claim is based on what we know today is false. That, you know, if you don't have enough light, it'll be harder to read your book. I don't know if it's straining your eyes, but um, this, you know, this kind of emanating from the epicenter of Lukish and the Neela Labs, this eventually covered the entire country in the office spaces, the factories where people worked, and into their very homes. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much.